Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining this webinar today. Uh, my name is Eric Vargas. I'm part of the sales and marketing team here at Follow Up Power. In just a few minutes, we're going to be flipping it over to uh, CEO of Best Roofing, Greg Wallach. And we're going to discuss how he built his sales machine here in South Florida at Best Roofing. Just want to give a couple more minutes to those who are still logging on and joining, but we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Today's webinar is brought to you by Follow Up Power. We help construction companies turn more leads into jobs through our construction CRM and proven training to help drive sales. If you're interested in how Follow Up Power can help you grow your company's revenue, please book a one on one demo with me through the button below this video. Alrighty, now that I've seen that everybody has joined, that has signed up, want to do a quick bio about Greg um, and his life. Uh, so as you can see here, he went to the University of Miami, was actually the captain of the football team there, um, led that team to a lot of victories, and he was a second generation roofing contractor since 1978. You can see that's a picture of Greg, uh, with his great hair, his father, and his kids uh, in front of a best roofing truck. Uh, he was a former director of the NRCA. Um, he was a CEO and president of General Roofing Services until 2001. And uh, from there, he uh, started Best Roofing in South Florida and has grown the company to uh, $50 million in the Tri-County area. And they're still growing, uh, crushing their numbers. And um, he was he's also the... the chairman of the board of trustees for Everglades University and Kaiser University. So I'd like to welcome Greg Wallach and uh, flip it over to him. Uh, he's going to be discussing how he has built a successful sales organization at um, Best Roofing. A couple clarifications right. just so that you know and understand how I think. Um, I believe that our businesses are either growing or they're shrinking. There's just no standing still. You're you're either you're either taking market share or losing market share. You're either uh, getting traction or or losing traction. So that's just how I think. Um, our agenda for today is I'm a real fundamentalist. I, I go back to my days of playing ball, and uh, you know I think blocking and tackling is the key to uh, to every successful organization, making sure that you've got the fundamentals uh, in place. So what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about defining the sales process, um, hiring the right people, uh, providing leadership, and then holding your team accountable. Uh, first thing is let's talk about the sales process. and. Um, I, I ask every contractor and I ask myself, are we transaction focused? Um, and if you're transaction focused, you're most likely uh, doing a lot of bidding. And you, and if you're just bidding, you're probably doing some begging also. Um, the other side of the equation is, am I relationship focused? Um, and if you're relationship focused, you're in a position to do some negotiating. Um, whether you're transaction focused, which is relatively easy because uh, all you have to do is find something that needs a bid and then throw a number at it. And, and most of the time, the decisions are made based on, on a number. And I'm not saying that that's a bad business to be in. As a matter of fact, there was a, a chapter of my career where I, I was you know, a real transaction focused person uh, in the school board business and, you know, public bid openings. And if you're going to be in that transaction focused business, you just have to be very efficient and you have to um, be a low cost producer and understand really how to find the most um, the most advantageous solution 
so that you can get a little bit of margin in there. Transaction focus, bidding focus usually has a tendency to be a little bit lower margin. But it's not like you have to go out and find the work. The work finds you. So you, you, you don't really, most transaction focused um, companies don't have uh, much marketing expenses going on. Um, if you are relationship focused, um, it takes time. Uh, again, because relationships don't happen overnight. So there's two kinds of, uh, two kinds of models, either being uh, transaction focused or relationship focused. Um, and then the next thing is, how many hats do your, do your people uh, wear? Do, do your salespeople estimate? Do your estimators sell? Uh, do my sales and estimators project manage? There's just a lot of disciplines. Who does the takeoff? Um, and that, that needs to be defined. So, you know, I always challenge people to say, you know, define your sales process. You know, where does the lead come from? Um, how do we qualify the lead? Who performs the takeoff? Who does the estimate? Who presents the uh, proposal? Who follows up? Who project manages the job? Who interfaces with the client once the job's going on? So, uh, you know, these are all things that need to be defined for you to be have an effective uh, sales organization. Second component I want to talk about today is hiring the right people. Um, I've learned over my career that um, it's easier to teach roofing than it is how to behave. So, you know, I like to hire character and, and, and train the roofing. I, I'm, I'm worried less about how much experience you have and worried more about who you are. Um, Bobby Bowden, greatest coach in college football, winningest coach in college football. I saw him on, on uh, TV oh, a year or two ago. He was being interviewed by uh, some commentators, and they, they asked him, they said, Bobby, what was the secret to your success? I mean, you know, you, you're the winningest coach in college football. How, how, how did you do it? And he kind of chuckled like Bobby does, you know, in that old Southern way. And he says, you know what, it's 80% recruiting. I got, I, you know, I was a great recruiter. I got the right players on the field, and it's about 20% good coaching and good planning. And, and that's what I would say to, say to every one of us is we got to put the right you know people on the field. We got to have the right players you know representing us out there. Um, and and you really define your success by who you hire to a, to a certain extent. Um, I believe that there's two kinds of uh, of salespeople. I believe that there's hunters and I believe there's farmers. And I'm not saying uh, that any one is right. I think it just depends on. Um, what kind of business you have. Um, you know, if you're a hunter is somebody who's probably going to go out and find you new business, where a farmer is somebody that's going to just uh, maintain your, your existing clients and, and help them grow. Um, the characteristics of a hunter is that, you know, they're really good at bagging big jobs. Um, they take charge, they're aggressive, they're competitive, they, they have a really entrepreneurial you know, spirit about them. They're very individual. They're very hungry. A lot of times they're loners. A lot of times they're disruptive too. They can be very disruptive in your organization. Farmers, they're the kind of people that, that you know, really cultivate a relationship. They, uh, they, they kind of let things develop. They always ask, you know, the, the client, so what do you think? They're, they're collaborative. They're team players. Um, they're softer. They're nurturing a relationship. They're let, you know, they're like watering the plant and letting it grow. Um, you know, who do you need? I, you know, in, in my business, I've got both. I've got, I've got hunters and I got farmers, I, especially in my service department. We have a really big service department here and, um, and there's no selling going on. The sale took, took place the first time we did the project. Now what we're doing is we're just maintaining the relationship and, and I need a farmer type mentality uh, for that. Somebody who just uh, really nurtures the relationship, but I need new business coming in and I need new clients. So, I, you know, I've got a, I got a couple of hundred and, and a handful of farmers on, on my sales team. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think it's really important to uh, to have a written job description, and and you should have a written job description for every position within your company. Um, you know, it 
for sales, you really need to define what markets you're going to go after and who you want you know, your, your salespeople to pursue. Um, you want to make sure you're really defining the responsibilities and your expectations um, and making sure that the expectations are perfectly clear. Um, and, and what kind of competencies, what kind of skills should that person have uh, who's representing you? Um, I, I, all of my position descriptions, job descriptions, um, are formatted like this. You got a, a, a statement or objective of what, what's expected. Um, you want to make sure that you clearly define the responsibilities. Um, you want to talk about the reporting structure. Who do they report to? Um, what kind of skills and experience do you do you want them to have? And I and I really believe it's important to get the the salary uh, ranges and, and everything spelled out right up front. Nothing can ruin a good relationship faster than a dispute over money. Um, I believe that compensation drives behavior. I'm not, I'm not saying that I have any one particular compensation program that I think is best. I, I think a lot of that depends on the culture of your company and, um, and just how you go to market. Um, there are certain companies that are really successful with just commission only. Now, I can tell you this. When you have a commission only salesperson, they're going to be very, very loyal to themselves and to their clients. And they're not going to be as loyal to you because um, they only get paid when they sell. Um, there's uh, salary plus commission, um, which is, you know, not not a bad uh, situation for certain certain uh, kinds of uh, co cultures and companies. Uh, straight salary uh, would be something that you would probably do with somebody who is more on the farmer side where they're servicing existing clients um, or where you're not bringing in new business or when you're working on something that has a, a really long selling cycle. Um, salary plus a bonus um, is also something where you know you're going to have people that are going to probably be a little bit more loyal to the company uh, because they, they don't have to to sweat whether they get a commission or not to to feed their families. So um, I believe uh, that the compensation program that you that you need to that you should use with your organization is going to depend on the culture of your company and just how how you go to market. Um, I'm not advocating any one particular one. I'm, I'm saying it depends. Um, so how do you find the find people? Uh, you know, it's a tough market out there right now, pretty much across the board in everything. Um, you know, sometimes you target your competition. Um, uh, I find my best people come from my existing staff. Uh, they always know who other people that might be out there. So I, I'm a real believer in, in, in my existing staff. And I offer a bounty for anybody who, who gives us a referral. Um, you know, you can always be networking and finding people out there. Social media um, is a good way also to stay connected. LinkedIn is, a, is an awesome source for uh, finding people. Um, traditional media, I think, it, I think that's pretty much over. Nobody puts ads in the newspaper or anything like that anymore. Um, networking in associations is really a good way to find people. Um, and you know what? You can use a headhunter. I haven't had tremendous success with headhunters. I could find basically the same resumes, you know, on Monster or a lot of these uh, other, uh, you know, web-based kind of um, uh, resources to help you find people. So I'm not a real advocate of headhunters. I've used them in the past. I, I kind of feel to a certain extent they just broker resumes. And, and, and then they get a big fee for it. Um, I'm a real big believer in uh, doing behavior assessments, um, especially re knowing that 50% of all forecasted sales are lost due to uh, sales force turnover. Sales force turnover is usually where the greatest turnover is in, in, in most organizations. I, I'm really lucky right now. I've got a great sales team. I've got 10 salespeople on our sales team. Um, plus five estimators, so that gives us about 15 people, and, and it's been really stable. But what we did was we, we got tremendously serious about um, hiring the right people and making sure that we had a good compensation program in place. Um, uh, these personality assessment tools, they, they help you understand just how, how somebody's wired, uh, what kind of work style they have. Um, it identifies their talents and behaviors, their, their ideal work environment the keys to motivating them and managing them and, and, and 
it also helps identifying their areas for improvement or better said where their weaknesses are now I don't believe that we're in the behavior modification business I'm personally in the roofing business so I'm not looking to change and modify behaviors I'm looking to put people in positions where they can be successful and um, so just knowing what somebody's not good at says don't put them there don't try to make them into something that they're not try to put them in a position that, that they can be successful at kind of uh, another way to maybe look at it would be you know don't think you can take somebody who's a good offensive lineman and put them out as a wide receiver and that they're going to catch a lot of balls. They're just not wired for that. They're not built for that. But they're great offensive linemen. So, you know, put people in positions where they can be successful is what I think. Um, the personality uh, assessment tool that I really have, you know, have learned to, to use is the DISC profile assessment tool. Um, and what it does is it identifies uh, your strengths, weaknesses, and, uh, and just how you think um, you're most everybody is either outgoing or they are reserved they're either people oriented or they're task oriented and what happens is this test allows you to to uh, measure somebody's uh, th there's four basic uh, personality profiles there's the dominance the influencer the compliance or the steady or somewhere in between um, everybody falls somewhere in between they might, and they'll have a tendency to be a certain way. I'm going to share with you my personality profile. Um, it, the, you take it, it's a multiple choice um, test, it's taken online. It really shouldn't take more than 15 minutes uh, when you do it. Um, and here's, here's what my test came out. Again, I told you there's, there's four primary um, four primary uh, you know personality types there's the dominance the influencing the steadiness and the compliance and and um, the the line right here is you know this line right here in the center um, is going to define you know if that is a a really strong characteristic now I have a tendency to fall into the dominance I'm driving ambitious pioneering gives you all these adjectives um, I'm also a good influencer um, I'm not the steadiest person you know I don't have quite the patience um, and um, I'm not quite as compliant as uh, some people including my wife would like me to be um, but you know this is just who I am um, the test always uh, also you can see here I, you know I took this back in 2008 I've taken the test a handful of times since then and you know what it comes out basically the same way every time but uh, you know th this is called the wheel uh, the success wheel and what this says is that my my natural um, my natural you know personality is that I'm a, a, a conductor persuader my adaptive is that I'm really a conductor you know under pressure I'm gonna I'm gonna lean towards the dominant um, personality characteristic that I have um, but I, I'm a I'm a real believer. Like for me, if you're not a conductor, a persuader, a promoter, I don't think you belong in sales. Um, if you're in business development, I'm looking for you know a promoter, a, a, a relator. If I if I'm hiring an estimator, I'm looking for an analyzer. If I'm hiring um, uh, somebody who's going to work in the field, I'm I'm looking for somebody who's going to be a coordinator uh, or a supporter. So. You know, and I found what I found is I, I tested my best people, found out where they were, and then when I when I'm getting ready to hire somebody, I you know want to make sure that I test and that they're they're wired to do the job that I'm asking them to do. Now, is this absolutely positively you know uh, you know the way that could somebody not be successful if they weren't wired like that? No, I've, there's exceptions out there, but you're going to have a tendency that uh, you know if uh, somebody's wired to do a, a particular job, they're going to be better at it than people who aren't. So I'm a real believer in this. I think, you know, I do this for, for everybody. I even did it to my wife before we got married. Um, and, she, and I showed her mine. That was the other thing, too. I said, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm like this. I want you to know this going in, and I'm probably not going to change. So, you know, and I'd like to know a little bit about how you are. And, uh, so, you know, I'm not going to try to change you because, you know, it, it just works better like that. Um, I, I think you need to have a good prepared list of questions before you uh, 
you know, start interviewing somebody. Um, it's always best to ask them what's the perfect role for you, um, who was your best boss and why, and, and if you're going to be the boss, you want to find out, you know, how that, what they're expecting from you and, and how you can be effective with them. How do you organize your priorities? Kind of what tools do you use? Do you, you, you know, do you use Google, you use Outlook, you know, what do you use to organize yourself? Do you use a yellow pad, you know? Um, this is a good question I always ask. Who's been the most influential person in your life and why? Um, I had somebody the other day that, uh, that had been referred by somebody else and, you know, I asked them this question, who was the most influential person in your life? And they, they, they told me somebody that I knew and I'm sitting here thinking, holy mackerel, if that's the most influential person in your life, I'm not sure if I want you working with me. But, you know, a lot of times you'll hear things like, you know, it was my father or it was my mother. And, and then you ask the question, why? You know, um, uh, and you'll learn a lot about somebody. Um, and then here's a question I always ask. What's your greatest skill, asset that you'd be bringing into the organization? Um, and here's something else, too. Past performance predicts future performance. Um, uh, you know, an, another p couple of questions I ask is, what's the most significant personal accomplishment that you've had? And then what's the most significant professional accomplishment that, you, that you've had? Because again, if past performance predicts future performance, I want to know, you know, what's your most significant thing that you've ever accomplished? If, you know, graduating from high school is, well, you, you probably know that that's uh, not going to be somebody that's going to work in an executive type position for you. Um, not, not always, not always. I'm not saying that you have to have a college degree or anything like that, but, you know, again, past performance predicts future performance. Um, okay, now here's where a lot of it comes down to just you. Are you a supervisor or are you a leader? Um, you know, is this you? Are you, are you, are you somebody who's kind of like this, who's a little bit pompous, or are you somebody like this who, you know, um, gets gets down and, and and on the same level as the players and, and, and who's, you know, committed to teamwork and winning championships, you know. Um, supervisors, they, they kind of ask questions um, when or they answer questions when they're asked. And, and a leader will ask questions uh, to help, you know, identify what's going on in the team and to better understand what's going on. A supervisor will um, describe excellence to a team, but a real leader, he's going to model it by, by working with a team. A supervisor is going to, you know, he's only going to provide coaching when, when he's forced to, but a, a, a leader is going to provide coaching on an ongoing activity and he's always going to be working with you to become better. Um, supervisors have a tendency to just focus on deficiencies um, where, you know, leaders are going to celebrate accomplishments, and it could be just a, a really simple accomplishment, you know, but people always respond better to um, being caught doing things right instead of caught doing things wrong. Um, supervisors have a tendency to just only give feedback during evaluations, and some companies only give evaluations or reviews um, once a year. You know, I found that, you know, in my companies, I've always done evaluations and reviews once a quarter, um, and, and that's a formalized time where we sit down and we have an adult conversation, um, and, and leaders provide consistent, constant, timely feedback, um, and that's how you're going to build winning teams, uh, by, by working as a leader versus as a supervisor. Um, here's something that I learned that, uh, a while ago, and, and this was like a, a huge aha moment for me. Um, it's a, a sales statistic. Um, and this is this is common knowledge. You can look this up on the internet. Um, Forty-eight percent of salespeople submit a proposal and never follow up with a prospect. Forty-eight percent. Twenty-five percent follow up a second time and, and then they stop. Twelve percent of all salespeople make three contacts and then they give up. Only ten percent of of salespeople make more than three percent uh, or three contacts with the uh, with the buyer. Okay, now here, here we go. 2% of all sales are made on the first contact. Um, unless you're in just one of those smaller transaction-focused situations where it's a one-call close. But most of your, your um, bigger 
type projects are never closed on the first contact. 3% of sales are made on the second contact, 5 on the on the third, 10% of sales are made on the fourth contact. Now, a contact could be a phone call, it could be an email, it could be a presentation, you know, so let me just qualify what a contact means. But 80% of all sales are made on the fifth to 12th contact. Let me tell you what, when I learned that, when I learned that, that was like a, an awakening, an aha moment for me. And I said, holy cow, all I got to do is be the guy who hangs in there and makes the four, you know, the most follow-up phone calls. And um, I, had a, I had a situation um, uh, on Doral Country Club. Doral Country Club, you know, it's an icon of a property down here in South Florida. Um, it's now the Trump, um, uh, Trump International Doral Country Club. Uh, our, our president purchased it. Um, but I had the privilege of, of putting all the roofs on out there um, oh, a couple of years ago. The, the entire place got, got roof, the roof replaced. And that selling cycle took, took me three years. And, um, and when I got, got the contract, I asked the, uh, the uh, construction manager who was working on that job, he's a guy named Ed Nystrom, I said, hey, Ed, you know, and this is after I got the contract we were working, and I said, how, how come you picked me? Why did you pick me to do this job? And he says, you know what, Greg? He said, you were the only guy that hung in there with me. He says, what ended up happening, to be honest with you, is after about a year, you were the only person I was talking to. It was just a matter of me getting the money and, and, and helping the uh, owners, you know, select select the tile color and, and stuff like this and get all our design work. But, you know, you were the one who stuck with me through the whole thing. And, and I just kind of like went with you because you were the last man standing. And in addition to the fact, that, you know, you, uh, you, you just always kind of followed up with me when you said you were going to be. And that, and that was something that I, that I always do. I always ask, when's the most appropriate time for me to follow up with you? So, um, and, and I'm a real big believer in pre-qualifying. Um, making sure that, you know, and, I, and I, we have a, uh, we have a, a, a seven-step process of pre-qualifying, uh, whether we want to work with somebody. The first thing we do is we do relate, relate and connect. Then we have what we call the rules of engagement. I'm not going to go into these. This is something that the, the, the people that follow up, you know, have taught us. Um, then we talk about, you know, what's the problem? We want to find out, you know, what, why are we even talking? Why, why are you talking to us about purchasing a roof? Um, and then, you know, we always want to do the money step. You know, what kind of budget do you have? Do you have funding available? Is this going to take financing? But, but you got to get the money step on the table. And then um, the, the, the next is what's the decision process? Um, you know, a, a question that we always ask you know, and we train our people to ask is who besides you is, is part of this decision-making process? Um, sometimes it's an individual. Sometimes it's a community. Um, and then after we've got those five items, relate and connect, rules of engagement, what's the problem, the, what kind of money do you have, what kind of decision process, then we present. Because what we want to do is we want to present to the problem, to the decision maker, in a way that's going to give us the most chance of, uh, of, uh, of winning that. And then the last thing is following up. I mean, if 80% of all sales are made on the 5th to 12th call, you just want to make sure you're the guy who's making that 5th to 12th call. Um, how do you hold your team accountable? Um, I'm a real believer uh, that if you ask a salesperson how you're doing, he's always going to tell you that he's doing great. And um, self-evaluations are a terrible indicator of performance. Um, people can lie about numbers, um, but numbers can't lie about people. You have to have facts. You've got to have numbers that you can measure somebody by. Um, and, and I'm a real believer that if you manage the behaviors, the results take care of themselves. Too many, too many sales organizations just say, what did you close? And, and there's not a lot of attention paid, you know, to what's happening, you know, along the way and, and what those behaviors are. Again, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a real fundamentalist. I believe in, in blocking and tackling and uh, what gets measured gets done, you know, you want to make sure that every lead that comes into your organization gets parked with somebody and it gets handled right. Um, who does the surveys on the project? When are the meetings? Pricing and estimating. Who's doing that? When's that getting done? Proposals. You know, when did, when when was that sent out? Calls and emails. 
when are contracts secured? These are all things that, that you want to measure because if you're measuring these activities, um, everything else is going to take care of itself. Um, and you, you usually have to have a system that will do this for you. Um, and the things that I believe that a system must have is, you know, monitoring when's your next follow-up. You can't remember that. Um, you got to have a system in place that, 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 that tugs on you and says it's time to make a call or time to send an email or time to send a text. A text. Um, that's an, another thing. When I ask somebody, when's the most appropriate time for me to follow up with you, I'm always going to ask you, and what's the most appropriate way for me to follow up with you? You want me to call you, email you, text you, Pony Express? I mean, what, what, how do you like to communicate? Um, your system ha needs to be able to help you set priorities. Um, needs to coordinate work activities. Um, I'm a real believer in goal setting. Um, you know, if you set goals, you'll have a tendency to achieve goals. If you don't set goals, you're probably going to underachieve what you were capable of. Um, I think you got to um, measure your communications. How many emails, how many phone calls were made? And, um, and if you know, you know, what your, what your activities are, you can, you can forecast what the future is going to be based on, you know, previous activities. So here's the, here's the million dollar question. What, what are you using to, to hold your team accountable? Um, I use the, uh, the follow-up program. Uh, Eric, if you could kind of help me, help me with this. We're going to go into, you got my follow-up program. Um, we're going to try to bring up, you know, my, um, okay, here we go. Um, this is, this is the follow-up program that, that we use here at Best Roofing. And this is, um, Eric, can they see my mouse going? Is that working? Like yeah. Okay. Um, we're looking at the home page. When you log in, and everybody has a login, you go directly to the home page. Now, this is our company overview. If we were to um, scroll down here, we can do each individual. So the company overview is, is a roll-up of um, all the activities. So if we look here, um, my, my pipeline, I have $170 million worth of bids on the street. That's 1,334 proposals, bids that, we've, that we have put on the street that a decision has not been made yet with. Now, pipeline management is one of the most critical things that, that, that we as uh, leaders need to pay attention to. And um, I believe that <clears throat> pipeline management starts with knowing when a decision is going to be made. So when, when you ask uh, a client when you submit a proposal to them, and you should probably know this before you submit a proposal to them, is, you know, when do you anticipate having this work done? Sometimes uh, people are saying, look, I want to get it done, like, right away. Well, we would call that a hot. We're in decision time. Sometimes they say, you know, I'm probably six months out. Sometimes they get sticker shock and they say, boy, I'm, I, I, you know, I've got to get financing in place. Um, and then sometimes they tell you right away, I, you know, you're going to get this job and it's, uh, and it's yours. I just need to uh, get the contract written. So we believe in classifying our pipeline as contracts to be signed, um, hops, which are things that are in negotiation, warms, something that's six months out, or active, which is something that's a year out. Now, a closing ratio. There's all kinds of ways to spin a closing ratio. And, and you know, until you start doing it like this, and I think this is the absolute best way to do a closing ratio, you take, you take the number of decisions. Like over the last year, and the, the way this uh, program works is um, every day, one day drops off and a new day is added. So over the last year, $68 uh, million worth of decisions were made. 1,585 proposals a decision were, were made on. Now, we have 46% of our proposals that are, that are made uh, from the dollar standpoint, we close. So we're closing 46% of our, our proposals. We're closing 73% of the people that we touch. So seven out of 10 people that we touch, um, we close. Now, uh, this has a lot to do with we have a big service business. 
and a, a lot of that those are, are one call closes so we close a lot of those by just being really efficient because somebody usually has a leak um, but I can tell you right now 46 percent of my work uh, to the dollar closes and I can go over here to my hots and I, I know that in the in the in the next 90 days because that's what our selling cycle is for most of our work is a 90-day period we're commercial doing primarily commercial work 46% of that 26 million is going to close in the next 90 days it's happened consistently for me over the last five years since I've been you know disciplined in following this system so if you want to know what the future is know what your closing ratio is know how many projects you have in decision mode like we have 441 bids that are that are going to have decisions made um, we're going to get 46 percent of that 26 million um, and then we also have contracts to be signed these are these are uh, projects that that uh, our salespeople you know have been told you're going to get that and we always say you would bet your paycheck on it and if I wanted to know what that you know what that consisted of I can drill into this and I can see I've got 17 projects and and what the you know what which projects there are and um, you know what the what the base bid was who the estimator was who the account manager was who the takeoff person was and then if I wanted to go into detail I can I can look at this drill into it and this is, gives me all the job information um, we talked about pre-qualification this tool one of the things I love about it is it helps pre-qualify our clients um, and you know we've got five primary pre-qualification um, issues relate and connect rules of engagement finding the problem money step um, there's little drop downs here that, that gives you you know you know conversation things like you know if you're going to relate and connect let's let's talk on a first name basis talk about family recreation um, discuss the weather discuss you know just kind of get things on the you know get some conversation going um, so this is a really really neat tool let me go back to the pipeline um, home page here okay now we talk about goal setting um, we believe that there's you know three primary goal settings that we do as a company um, putting bids on the street we, we have a goal of trying to get 13 million uh, bids 13 million dollars worth of bids on the street each month and you can see in January we fell a little bit short in February we we were a little bit above we almost hit it here in March looks like April is going to be a, a really good month but we know this we know this if we're not getting bids on the street we don't have a possibility of securing work and and here's what I also know when I have months that I have low bidding 90 days from now I'm gonna have low closings because um, that's our selling cycle and you know if you're not putting work on the street you, you don't have a chance of, uh, of achieving you know success um, then we like to measure you know how many contracts and we, we secure um, dollars in contracts we secure versus our goal like our goal is to to close four four point four million a month um, and then uh, we we measure that like we're um, you know we had a really good January February is a little bit disappointing um, March we fell a little bit short of goal um, April when I look up here at my contracts to be signed it looks like we're gonna blow that out of the water so you know I'm, I'm really confident that we're gonna you know revenue and, and sales are going to continue to do well um, we talked a lot about measuring behaviors um, this is the one tool the, the only the only sales automation tool that I know of that measures behaviors behaviors are things like um, how many meetings have you attended how many calls have you made um, this system it does that by just checking a box and it totals it up we're falling a little short of the behaviors that, that we had, that we had goal set but um, it, you know things are falling in line and uh, and you know we use this as a management tool when somebody falls short um, the next thing I want to show you is the dashboard um, everybody has a dashboard and the, the dashboard helps set priorities we're going to go into um, one of my service sales guys here let's talk about Casey um, Casey's a relatively new guy that's working with us he um, uh, he was actually a, um, a bartender 
that had a great personality. We profiled him. He wanted to get into the roofing business. Uh, we brought him in. He spent about 90 days in training, and now he's uh, selling service for us. But every day, Casey comes in, and Casey looks at his dashboard, and uh, and right here is his next follow-up contacts. Now, Casey does a lot of transactions, and we can see he was supposed to follow up on the 17th and the 18th. You know, here we are on the 19th. So Casey's been out in the field a lot. He's got a lot of following up to do. I got to get. I got to get in and speak with Casey because he's fallen a little bit behind in his follow-ups. Now, if it's you can see over here on the left-hand side, if it's red, it means it's due. If it's green, it's not due. So I can tell right now Casey is behind. And uh, after I get done with this this presentation, I'm going to walk down to Casey and I'm going to show him his dashboard and I'm going to ask him, how are you doing on your follow-ups? Because uh, you've made some commitments, obviously, that you haven't. Um, this also, you know, meetings, uh, takeoffs, uh, revised takeoffs, when an estimate is due, um, you know, all of the things that, all the behaviors that, that Casey's supposed to be doing, everything is uh, on his dashboard. Um, I took you into file data. File data is um, this. The this is when the lead comes in. It gets logged in. All the job information. We do the pre-qualification. Um, once the project is bid, there's a, a base bid. You know what the contract amount came in at. What's your gross margin? How many labor hours? Um, who worked on this? Who was the estimator? Who was the account manager? Um, here's all the sales behaviors when they're due. All of this goes on on the, the dashboard. Um, another thing I love about this is it does all the analytics here. Um, it does, you, you can do a lead recap, captured contract report. I can do graphs over here um, that just show you know how how are we doing on contracts, proposals. You know um, you can slice and dice this information really out of the box any way you want. Um, another nice uh, component is the, the report card component. Um, this helps uh, me know, okay, like for right now for this month, um, we've put, <clears throat> we've done 159 estimates, we've put 158 proposals, uh, we've secured 69 contracts. Um, if I wanted to uh, know the specifics, I could expand this, and this tells me all of the estimates, and, uh, and if I wanted to drill down into one of them, I can do that. Um, so it just makes the information really easily accessible. Um, I can look at it by company. Let's go ahead and take a look at old Casey um, and see what he's been doing. Uh, oops. Casey. Okay, Casey has gotten 18 uh, estimates done, 17 proposals, you know, he's, he's secured 12, 12 uh, contracts already, uh, totaling about $48,000 worth of work. Casey works in our service department. But but what this does is it uh, it's a phenomenal tool to help our, our salespeople stay organized. And um, and it also helps management understand just kind of how organized somebody is. is. And, and I'm a real believer that organization leads to success. So, um, that's a quick overview of the tool that we use, follow up, uh, and how I use it, you know, and, and our sales managers use it and how our people use it. Um, if you want more information on that, uh, you can contact the guys at, at follow up. Um, Ryan and Eric, I would recommend. Um, so Let me just kind of recap everything. You know, I, I really believe that you got to define your your sales process, um, define who's going to be wearing what hats, and how you know just how you're going to do business. Um, remember what Bobby Bowden says: it's 80%. You know, putting the right people in the field. You got to have the right you know people on your team um, uh, working for you. And you know, I really believe in using behavior assessment tools to help you with that. You know, you got to provide leadership. Don't be a supervisor. Catch people doing things right. Um, and, 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 and it'll be awesome, and your people will respond to that. Um, and then hold your team accountable. Help, have them set their own goals, and then just hold them accountable to, uh, to setting goals. Um. Wow, Greg, thanks. 
feels like you're drinking from a fire hose. There's a lifetime worth of uh, principles and lessons there that we can learn from to grow our business. Um, what I like to talk about now is just next steps. Uh, you saw how Greg used uh, follow up power to help grow his revenue and his sales. Um, so if you are interested in checking out you will follow see up a power button below this video telling you to schedule a time with me. Uh, that gives you access to my calendar and then we can dive deep into your business to see how follow-up power can work for you. Uh, thank you so much for attending this webinar today and we look forward to future conversations together.